You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. I'm David Waters. Miles O'Brien is off this week. You may have wondered where we've been. Well, our team was working on the public debut of a brand new sport called rocket racing. Think of it as a cross between Star Wars pod racing and NASCAR. The Rocket Racing League launched a pair of X racers in a kickoff event at the Quick Trip Air and Rocket Racing Show in Tulsa, Oklahoma last week. That showcased the planes themselves as well as a virtual racetrack in the sky. Miles O'Brien launches our coverage this week from Tulsa. Here's a sight and a sound that will get your heart pumping. A pair of rocket racers in the sky, thousands of spectators cheering them on, and coming along for the ride, virtually. It's great. The technology is awesome. You know, how in the world they can pull this off. And, and I, I mean, it's just amazing. It was the first time two rocket racers flew together in front of more than 30,000 people. It happened at the Quick Trip Tulsa Air and Rocket Racing Show, and it was the realization of a decade-old dream of Rocket Racing League founder Peter Diamandis. But when I saw those two vehicles coming off the runway one afternoon, that was, that was the payoff for all the hard work. Rocket Racing is a mashup between Star Wars pod racers and NASCAR. Delta Wing Velocity aircraft are rigged up with rocket motors built by Armadillo Aerospace, which can generate 2,000 pounds of thrust in an instant. Now that's a kick. In a propeller or a driven aircraft or when you're in a jet, you uh, wind up on the power and you can feel it coming in as you move the throttle forward. Here you flip a switch and you go from no thrust to full thrust in less than a second and you feel that kick in your back. Rocket racing uses high technology to bring fans along for the ride using augmented reality. Fans can enjoy rocket racing on jumbotrons or iPhones and iPads, and when the race is over, you can still enjoy the action. Yes, there is now an app for that. The long range goal, fans will be able to join in and race virtual X racers beside the real thing. Rocket racing may be the first participatory spectator sport. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, I'm Miles O'Brien. It was really cool stuff, and if you want to see more of that, go check out the full webcast with Miles at www.livestream.com slash rocket racing. You can watch the live window or load up the clip on demand and watch your favorite parts. For all you shuttle fans out there mourning the upcoming end of the shuttle program, you get at least a two-month reprieve. NASA has delayed the final scheduled flight of Space Shuttle Endeavour from July to November while researchers swap out a magnet on the science payload. The original magnet on board the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer was powerful, but only meant to last three years. Now that the space station operations have been extended into the 2020s, well, mission managers have opted to swap the magnet out in favor of a weaker one that should last some years longer. The AMS will search for antimatter, dark matter, and measure cosmic rays. While the weaker magnet will make science ops a little more difficult, Mission managers say adding extra lifespan to the $1.5 billion science payload will make up for that. Launch of AMS on Endeavour's STS-134 mission is now scheduled for no earlier than November, which at the moment makes it the last scheduled space shuttle flight. But stay tuned on that. There are lots of rumors flying around that we could see a slip for Discovery and STS-133 as well. And speaking of final scheduled flights, the final one for Atlantis is just weeks away. SDS-132 is scheduled to launch to the space station at 2.19 p.m. Eastern, May 14th, on a 12-day mission to the ISS. Station assembly is on the home stretch now. For the Atlantis crew, they have to expand the Russian real estate with delivery and installation of the Mini Research Module 1 to the Zarya module. The astronauts will also perform three spacewalks to replace half a dozen old batteries, install new communications equipment, and add a platform to the Canadian Dexter robot. Mark your calendars and join us for our marathon coverage of the final scheduled flight of Atlantis. We'll get underway at spaceflightnow.com at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, 14.30 GMT. Meanwhile in space, the six-member ISS crew is getting resupplied. An unmanned Russian Progress spacecraft blasted off this week from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, carrying more than two and a half tons of food, 
fuel, oxygen, propellant, and other supplies for the orbiting outpost. The station was flying directly over the launch pad at the moment of liftoff, and take a look at this shot from Suichi Noguchi. Pretty cool shot from overhead. While NASA preps Atlantis for flight, the Air Force's newer Mini-Me version of the shuttle is in orbit with its secret payload. The Air Force launched its unmanned X-37B space shuttle for its inaugural mission from the Cape on April 22nd. At one quarter the size of NASA's shuttle, the Air Force says the X-37B is an updated version of the shuttle with new heat shield technology and updated guidance and navigation. The military isn't saying what experiments the test flight has and says it's classified what it's doing in orbit. They also will not say how long it will be in orbit, but some estimates put that somewhere between weeks and months. The X-37B will come in for a landing, much like the shuttle, but at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, and in this case, entirely on autopilot. It's no secret that the president has proposed the cancellation of the Constellation program, but development continues while Congress makes a decision. A new launch abort system for the Orion capsule will be tested May 6th at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. The abort system is designed to get the crew capsule quickly away from a failing rocket, as part of the test, it will blast the dummy module away from the pad, reaching speeds of up to 445 miles an hour in just three seconds. Meanwhile, Orbital Sciences, which is part of the launch abort team, says it's been told by prime contractor Lockheed Martin that no more funding is available for the abort system after the end of April. But the show will go on, and next week's test is still a go. We'll bring you updates about that on SpaceFlightNow.com. And more tests for the Constellation program continue at the U.S. Army Yuma Proving Ground in Arizona. A drogue parachute designed to return the Ares-1 booster segments safely to the ground worked as advertised. The test was done by dropping a 77,000-pound dummy payload and parachute out the back of a C-17 airplane 25,000 feet up. The drogue is the first chute that opens, so it absorbs the brunt of the force needed to slow down a falling object, such as a booster. NASA says this was the heaviest load ever released by a C-17 in flight. Imagine being that pilot. SpaceX is counting down to the inaugural flight of its Falcon 9 rocket from Cape Canaveral. President Obama joined SpaceX founder Elon Musk for a close-up look at final launch preparations during his recent visit to the Space Center. But exactly when Falcon 9 will fly remains a mystery. It had been targeted for May 8th, less than a week before the upcoming space shuttle launch, but there's still more work to be done on the flight termination system that's designed to destroy the rocket if it flies off course, which makes May 8th unlikely and more likely no earlier than May 11th. The 15-story Falcon 9 rocket is designed to send cargo to the International Space Station after the shuttle's retirement. We didn't want to let this slick story slip by, but NASA's Aqua satellite is keeping an eye on a massive oil spill off the southeast coast of the U.S. An estimated 5,000 barrels of oil have been leaking out since a drilling platform exploded off the coast of Louisiana April 20th. Aqua is providing a clear view of the oil slick as it travels, which is allowing emergency officials and coastal residents of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida to see where the oil slick is headed and when it will hit. The Hubble Space Telescope has just celebrated a big anniversary, 20 years in orbit. HST was launched April 24, 1990, aboard Discovery, and deployed one day later. That mission was piloted by none other than the current NASA Administrator, Charlie Bolden. It has not been a dull two decades in space for Hubble. Initially launched with a spherical aberration on its main mirror, resulting in blurry pictures, the telescope got a set of corrective lenses in 1993 and was off to the races, snapping picture after picture and wowing astronomers and the public alike. Astronauts visited Hubble a grand total of five times, installing new equipment and instruments that should keep the images flowing for years to come. And speaking of incredible images, check out these pictures of the sun, and yes, you can look directly at them. These are compliments of NASA's new Solar Dynamics Observatory. Scientists knew before that the sun is an active place, but these new images show processes like the sunspots and solar flares, along with solar winds and coronal mass ejections in unprecedented detail. Solar storms can impact us when charged particles erupt and wash out over the solar system. Think of SDO the next time a geomagnetic storm knocks your iPhone or Blackberry out of commission for a few hours. The holy grail of solar research is to better predict space weather. 
Who knows, a few years down the road, we could turn on the TV news and hear a space meteorologist predict stormy weather with a 50% chance of sunspots. And lest we toot NASA's horn a little too much, we should point out that the European Space Agency also has a new instrument in the space weather game. Check out this solar eruption captured earlier this month by ESA's Proba 2 satellite. This solar flare occurred on April 3rd. Though it was classified as weak, it caused the biggest geomagnetic storm of the last three years, lighting up the northern and southern lights, but no damage reported to electrical grids or satellites in orbit. You've got to love a telescope that's name says just what it is. So kudos to the folks at the European Southern Observatory who are hard at work on the, get this, extremely large telescope. EELT, as it will be known, is to have a mirror 42 meters in diameter. The ESO Council announced this week that their aptly named new instrument will be built in Chile, in the central part of the Atacama Desert. Conveniently, not far from another ESO gem, the Very Large Telescope. Gotta love those names. The EELT will be the largest telescope in the world and view the heavens in the optical and infrared spectra. Atacama's high desert is ideal for stargazing with 320 clear nights per year. I wonder who counts that. Continuing our European theme, ESA's orbiting Planck Observatory has used its microwave eyes to look through gas and dust at two active star-forming regions in our galaxy. These images of the Orion Nebula and the constellation Perseus show what's going on in these stellar nurseries there that we can't see with our eyes. Planck's mission is to peer beyond our Milky Way and map the radiation left over from the Big Bang. Still relatively nearby star regions like these can't help but get in the way as Planck tries to look beyond them. You might think of these images as just a little something extra. Run! Run for your lives! Well, he didn't exactly say that, but British astrophysicist Stephen Hawking has now weighed in on the topic of extraterrestrial life. And he's not so sure that the aliens will be coming in peace. In a new documentary to air on the Discovery Channel, Hawking says the sheer number of stars in all the billions of galaxies in the universe makes it overwhelmingly likely that intelligent life exists out there somewhere. But he's not so sure that visitors to Earth would want to be friends. More likely, they'd want to raid Earth for its resources. Hide the wife and kids. So on that cheery note, it's time for us to close for the week. We appreciate you all sticking with us over the past few weeks. We've just had a lot of balls in the air, and there are only four of us working on this show, but we value your viewership and are back in the saddle. If you want to send us a note, shoot us an email to twist at spaceflightnow.com, tweet us at This Week in Space, or meet us on the blog at milesobrien.com. And don't forget to stop on that PayPal link if you can help keep us on. We really do appreciate it. And don't forget to check out the webpage of our sponsor, Binary Space. We really appreciate their support. Next week, more on the launch abort system test we told you about earlier. NASA developed it for the seemingly doomed Constellation program. Even so, the test goes on, and so will we. Until then, be careful, and don't talk to aliens.